Okay, so uh, welcome to this first class, which is late, okay? Because normally I had uh, other groups, okay, in semester one, and then I had, uh, you were left without teacher, so, uh, and no, no one from outside can take a higher level students, okay, semester four, five, six. Okay, so uh, I'm going to teach you this course, General Linguistics, okay? So please note this information, okay? So uh, my email is there, okay? And then uh, a YouTube channel that I have where I post some videos, etc., about linguistics, about uh, TEFL, okay, the use of technology in teaching, etc. Many videos in there. Videos that I make myself and videos that I find elsewhere on YouTube, okay? And then also note down please this website or it's a blog. You don't see it, but it's I tell you what is in there. It's English Studies Info. English Studies Info dot blogspot dot Okay. English studies info, one word attached, dot blogspot dot com. This one I'm going to use it to be connected to you. So, uh, for example, I will post for you the syllabus in there. Okay, so you go there and you check it. It's not now, but when I go back, I post it for you. And also, we we'll post other information, other resources that you can rely on to deepen your knowledge about this course, okay, general linguistics. So, English studies info dot blogspot dot com. Good. So, the main textbook we're going to rely on. The main textbook we're going to rely on is this one. It's by Widowson, okay, published by Oxford, okay, University Press. And the title, as you can see there, is Linguistics. So it covers all the things in a bit of detail about what we're going to introduce in the classes in here, okay? So I will be talking about the main ideas in every chapter. But then you will have to read the chapters on your own to do the details and to see what other examples, other information about what we will be talking about in class, okay? Uh, then the other materials that you can also rely on, they cover almost the same thing, but you can, you know, some book has some information, the other one doesn't have it, it etc. Examples here, not in here, and vice versa. This one is called How to Study Linguistics. Don't worry, don't take this information right now. So you can just go, when you go to the, to the blog, you will find this information, okay, for you, the references, uh, etc. okay? The other book also uh, that I rely on for my lectures is this one. It's called Ling Introduct uh, In Linguistics Introduction. It's uh, by a number of authors there, okay? These are the main references. But the main, the main textbook, you should definitely read is the first one, okay, which is the black one, okay? The black one, it's a good color for you. So just you have to take it seriously, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, these are the main textbooks, okay? So I will be posting the link, uh, the details about the references so they can get them on the blog, I show you. Okay, concerning the course content, so this is what we're going to cover in our lectures for the following classes, okay? So we're going to cover this. Uh, first today, we will be talking about introduction, okay? It's a kind of introduction to the field of general linguistics, in which we're going to talk about the scope of linguistics, okay? Uh, the nature of language, what is language, what is linguistics, what is language, okay? Main characteristics of lang linguistics, main characteristics of language, okay? Branches of linguistics, etc. Historical background in which we are going to talk about the schools because you know everything goes through a development, okay? The beginning is different from now. So the beginning there were some theories that are different from the theories existing nowadays. 
In the beginning, there were some principles, ideas, and approaches that are different from the ones we have nowadays. So there was a kind of historical development. So we have different schools that we're going to cover uh, the main ideas of these schools today. Okay, introduce them to you. Uh, okay, now then there is going to be uh, part two, principle and levels of analysis, in which we are going to talk about some some terminology and some ideas in here. So we are going to talk about what is type and what is token, and then we are going to talk about principles of classification, dimensions of analysis, levels of analysis. Okay, there is a mistake in there, but it's okay. Normally I should click enter to have it in a new line. Dimensions of analysis, okay, but it's not a problem. The third part, we're going to talk about. Uh, we are going to focus on the form of language, okay? What linguistics tells us about the form of language, okay? So in this one, we're going to talk about phonetics and phonology. So what is phonetics? What is phonology? You had some ideas before, semester one, two, I think, three or four. Okay, it talks about this phonetic transcription and so on. So we're going to refer to that again, and also uh, refer to phonology. Also, we're going to talk about morphology, okay, and syntax. What is morphology? What is syntax? Because this is what linguistics tells us about language. Because when we're going to see, lang uh, linguistics is the scientific study of language. Scientific investigation of language. Scientific description of language. So what does linguistics tell us about language? It tells us many things, okay, depending on the level of analysis. Depending on the level of analysis. There are different types or levels of analysis. There is a small level, medium level, and higher level. The small level is the sound. And here we're going to talk about phonetics, phonology, production of the sounds, and then the how the sounds interact together in the world, phonology. And then we're going to talk about morphology and syntax into the word, we move into the word, and then we move into the sentence, syntax. Okay? And then after this, in the first the last part, we're going to focus on meaning. Okay, because another dimension of linguistics or uh, that linguistics tries to end, uh, investigate is uh, focused on meaning, okay? Because meaning is one part of, of, uh, of, uh, of language, right? We don't have only the sounds. We have sounds, words, and then we have the meaning. So we have a field called, a bench called semantics, and then pragmatics. Pragma semantics, it focuses on the meaning outside of context. And pragmatics, it focuses on the meaning within a context. Either it can be a phrase, or a sentence or a context outside, okay? With whom you are, whom are you talking about? With where are you talking about? With what is the formality of the level of the of the context where you are? It's formal, informal, and things like this. Some variables related to this. So pragmatics, okay? So these are the main things we are going to cover in this, okay? In this class, okay? So today, as I told you, we are going to focus on the first part, which is general. Linguistics, the scope of linguistics, what is linguistics, okay, etc. Now, let's move on. So, this is what we're going to talk about today. So, we're going to try to see what is the scope of linguistics, okay? That is to say, what is linguistics? We're going to try to find, to, to discuss what is the definition, appropriate definition of linguistics, okay? After this, when we finish with discussing what is linguistics, we are going to move on to talk about the component or the unit of analysis okay, of this field called linguistics, which is language. What is language? Okay? And then when we, talk, when we say, uh, give a definition of language, we try to see what are the main characteristics, okay, the features of this language. It has got a number of features that don't exist or make it different from other means of communication because, as you know, uh, animals do communicate. They have their own language, okay? But the human language has got some interesting features that make it much better and different from other means of communication like the animal uh, language, okay? So what are these features we're going to see? And then at the end, we'll try to see uh, discuss uh, historical background, uh, let's say, uh, the developments, okay, of the different types of approaches 
okay, of linguistics, and these are referred to as schools of linguistics, okay? Now, so what is linguistics, okay? Linguistics, as you already can guess, uh, I suppose, is the systematic study of languages. It's a systematic study of languages, okay? So another thing uh, that you're going to find on the blog, I told you in the beginning, is this PowerPoint presentation. We have it there, and you can have it with you, okay? So you can take some notes now, but not all the notes. All, all the, you can take some notes, okay? That's good for you because it makes you follow me when I'm talking. So your attention is there, okay? But if you want all the details, you can have them when you have these slides, okay, on the blog. Now, here, well, what strikes your attention in this definition? What are the main words that you can find? Systematic study of language. Okay, so here we have the study of language, but not any kind of study. Because you can have different types of studies, right? You can have whatever study, and you can have organized, systematic, uh, detailed, uh, scientific Okay, uh, study, investigation. So linguistics is, is a science. Okay, so linguistics is a science. It's not anything else, it is a science. Okay, and when we say science, we're talking about systematicity, we're talking about organization, we're talking about data, very important data. You can't do any systematic study without data. You go and you collect data and then you compare and you have variables in there, you compare variables, you compare the data, and then you come up with a conclusion, okay? With findings, okay? So this is a systematic scientific study, okay? So it is a systematic study of languages, so there is data in there. And then, uh, linguistics tries to analyze the following aspects of language. What are these aspects? So these are the aspects it tries to, and to give us an answer, for which it tries to give us an answer. See, linguistics tries to give, tell us what language is, what is language. One of the main areas of linguistics is try to find answers for this question, okay? Language, what is language, to which we're going to go uh, in a while, okay, after this. What languages have in common? As you know, there are different Languages in the world. So one of the things that linguistics tries to understand is to find out the common things between languages. These are the common things that are shared between languages, and these are the differences between the languages. Okay? The next thing is social differences in language usage. So when you take language itself, Arabic, then French, then English, so you try to see what is common is, okay? Okay, you try to find what is common between these languages, okay? For example, they all have sounds, they all have uh, vowels, they all have consonants, they all have uh, different word order or the same word order. For example, French and English, they have almost the same word order, but Arabic and French, they have different word order. So you do focus on the language itself, okay? Then, when you uh, go here, you go into social aspects of language. So you have a mixture between society and language. Because as you know, we all Moroccans, we speak the same language. But when some people speak it differently from others, for example, women, ladies, they speak language to some extent, in some areas, in some aspects, differently from men. Okay? Uh, mechanics, they have their own jargon. Doctors, they have their own jargon. Okay, teachers and, and, a, and a class, the language in, the, uh, in a class is different from the language when you are eating couscous on a table, right? So there are different variables in there related to society that do have an impact on, okay, uh, language usage, okay? So this is another area in which is referred to as sociolinguistics. And I'm going to refer to these branches of linguistics later on, okay? Uh, uh, how languages change over time, okay, how languages change over time. This is another area, another aspect that linguistics tries to understand, which is trying to see and to investigate how language develops throughout time, okay? For example, they tell you that this sound existed in the past, 
but now it disappeared. This word exists in the past, but now it disappeared, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, another area. How languages work? Phonology, morphology, uh, syntax. How language in its own works, okay? How the sounds are combined together. And when they are combined together, are there any differences between this combination and the other combination? Cats, dogs. Cats say the same, uh, the same thing at the end, S. But after T, it is pronounced S, and after D, it is pronounced, you know this story, okay? So this is something that exemplifies for you how language works at the different levels of analysis, at the level of the sound, at the level of the word, at the level of the uh, sentence, right? Uh, and then, how languages vary. Okay, the differences between languages. In, okay, between Arabic and French, between dialectal Arabic, Moroccan Arabic, and Amazigh, etc. Between Amazigh or Tashilhid and then uh, Talifid. So there are differences, okay, there. How languages vary. How children acquire language. Okay, this is another area, another component, another aspect that linguistic tries to investigate and for which it gives us answers, okay? What are the, uh, the ways how the children acquire language? So they tell you, for example, that there are different stages, there is the blah, 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 whatever kind of stage where, bubbling stage, okay, where, you know, there are different details in there, I don't want to go in there, so there are stages. So it gives us an idea about how a child acquires a language. So this is another uh, field of, uh, or another area of investigation for uh, linguistics. Then, uh, finally, uh, how language reflects the mind. Okay, here we are talking about the relationship between the mind, brain, and language. For example, it tells you that there is an area in the brain uh, where, uh, which is specialized in the production of language. If that area is damaged, then the the human being doesn't speak or something, or doesn't make a whatever sound. Or, so the relationship between the mind and the brain and language. So it's called neurolinguistics, this one. It's called neurolinguistics, right? So these are the, uh, uh, the different types of questions that, for which linguistics uh, tries to find uh, an answer, right? It's okay, following so far? Okay. Now, so this, uh, what I spoke about uh, in the previous slide, uh, leads us to the discussion of what we have in this slide here, okay? And in this one, we are referring to uh, this lady here, okay, which is called uh, Jean Atkins, Atkinson, okay, uh, who wrote a book, who wrote a book called Linguistics, is, uh, has a number of books, but this one I'm referring to is called Linguistics. Uh, and in this book, in this book, it tries to depict. Okay, she depicts linguistics like a tree. From the previous slide, this is what I was referring to. And here she's given us a metaphor to to help us understand better what is linguistics. Okay, so uh, Jane Atkinson uh, depicts linguistics like a tree with many branches. So we have a tree in here. Okay. This is a tree, and then you have many branches in there, okay? This, I couldn't find a better picture for separate branches, but you can understand that we have branches in there, okay? Now, what do we have? We have in this tree, so we have what is referred to here as core linguistics, or what is the main linguistics related to the language itself. This is referred to as the core linguistics, or she refers to it as the core of linguistics. And then in which we have phonetics, as I told you, it deals with the investigation and the study of the sounds, how they are produced, the way, do you remember the manner of articulation, the place of articulation, the, those kind of terminology? So that refers to phonetics, it is the, how language is produced, okay? This field is called uh, phonetics. Then we have phonology. Phonology, we are no more dealing with the production of the sounds, we are starting to talk about how the sounds mix together, combine together in a word, etc. Okay? 
and how when they combine together what happens okay so this is uh, uh, the main story in relation to uh, phonology right then the other one is called morphology morphology we are also talking about combination of sounds but at a higher level okay Dif you have like syllables combined together okay and then syntax how uh, concerning morphology first uh, we are starting to talk about the word level okay we are no more focusing just on the sound separately we are moving into a higher level of analysis which is the word okay in which we start to see how the sounds are combined together the other one is more uh, syntax and here we are moving to a higher level which is the sentence how the words combine together okay and what happens the structure the sentence okay uh, this is the level and then we have uh, semantics semantics which is uh, which deals with meaning okay which deals with meaning okay uh, because uh, you can produce sentences but these sentences have no meaning okay colorless green ideas sleep furiously you know this is a kind of example given by Chomsky which is usually referred to refer to this idea here okay colorless green ideas sleep furiously grammatically it's correct phonetically it's correct phonologically it's correct morphologically it's correct syntactically it's correct but there is a problem with it. Do you understand what it means? No. Okay, why? Because there is another level of analysis where we have to pay attention to the, so to the words and the meaning, okay? The meaning of the words. And therefore, we have to combine words appropriately, not just randomly, okay? So, then the next level, which is syntax. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, pragmatics. Okay my animation again <coughs> pragmatics here it is okay pragmatics so pragmatics we are starting going out okay okay of the uh, sentence of the language itself we are going out okay that is say we are talking about other things like intention of the speaker because depending on your sentence you can have different intentions and therefore different meanings okay so this is pragmatics here. So here we are talking about the intention of the speaker, and we are talking about the cooperative principles, okay, maxims of, uh, okay, etc. So this is another field that we will uh, talk about towards the end of, the, of this class, okay, the last lectures. And then going further out, we are going further out. So you see, we are moving away from language, pure language, into other uh, aspects of, sorry. If I'm, uh, into uh, other uh, components. So therefore, we have uh, psycho, uh, sorry, sociolinguistics, which incorporates, okay, uh, the variables uh, related to society, like age, like uh, gender, like uh, education level, like uh, context, formality, informality, etc. So, because language can vary depending on these variables, urban versus rural areas, environment, the people in the rural areas do speak a little bit different, not a little bit, but to some extent, they are differently uh, from the people in the urban areas, right? Okay. Again, somebody who is educated speaks differently from someone who is not educated, okay? Never go on to school, it's okay? The language is different, even if it's Moroccan Arabic, okay? And then, psycholinguistics, in which we are talking about the acquisition of language, how children acquire a language, okay, what are the different stages, okay, through which the child goes when acquiring his first language. We can also talk about acquisition in relation to adults, talking about second language acquisition, and when you are an adult, and then you start learning, for example, I don't know, Spanish, or you maybe you don't speak French, Spanish, so you start learning, or English, for example, when did you learn English? You learn it, okay, uh, in high school maybe, yes, for you? Yes. High school, okay, or for the generations now, they learn it in middle school, okay, at the last year of middle school. So, psycholinguistics, okay, how people, children, adults, acquire a first language or a second language. Applied linguistics, 
Here we are moving or talking about the practicalities or the application of uh, field of language, okay, and linguistics into pedagogy. We are talking about a pedagogy here. Applied linguistics talks more on the pedagogy, on the teaching and learning of languages. And here comes the field of TFL, teaching English as a foreign language, for example, okay, or ELT, English language teaching. Okay, so pedagogy. So here we are talking about how to teach children or how to teach adults a language, how to teach speaking, how to teach uh, listening, how to teach whatever skill of a language. Okay, so applied linguistics. And then we have anthropological linguistics. So I guess just from the name, you can guess the meaning. Here we have a combination of two fields. We have anthropology, which studies the culture of the people. When you are talking about anthropology, you are talking about culture of the people. How do they wear clothes? What are the different meals they make? What are different occasions? For example, marriage. How do they celebrate marriage? Uh, do they have any kind of taboos? Okay. How do they? Uh, whatever thing related to culture. So anthropology. And then here it's of anthropological linguistics. So the combination or the impact of culture on language. Okay. So, this is uh, anthropological linguistics. Stylistics, it's related to uh, usually people doing uh, journalism, etc. Uh, so, you take, uh, it usually deals with written discourse, okay, which you try to analyze how the style looks like, what are the kinds of language that the author is using, okay, things like that. So, it's referred to the uh, stylistics. Computational linguistics. It refers to the study of linguistics using computers. Okay? Using computers. This is a field that is developing nowadays called computational linguistics. You use computers, technology, and etc. to investigate linguistics. You can investigate phonetics using computers. You can get etc. using it's also computational. And it's a very vast domain, so but for you just stop in here. Neurolinguistics, we have spoken about uh, the relationship between the brain mind, the brain, and language, okay, how uh, this uh, relationship works, okay, and I told you these stories of people who have damage somewhere, and then they have problems speaking, maybe problems speaking the language at all, they don't speak, or maybe they don't speak some sounds, or speak with difficulty, okay, so this is uh, uh, referred to as neurolinguistics, so this is how Atkins, Atkins uh, it picks the picture for us uh, 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 in relation to linguistics. So she sees it as a tree. And when you know the tree, it has the core, the main part of the tree, and then you have the branches. So the main part of the core linguistics is referred, these are phonetics, phonetics, etc. And then the other branches are, <coughs> are uh, what you have on, on the screen there. Okay? Uh, so this is. Uh, Okay, my animations, I shouldn't forget my animations. And then this is core linguistics. And then the other thing I want to uh, refer to, so you suppose these are different languages. These small trees in here, they are different languages. Another way or aspect of linguistics is that it tries to study or include some what we refer to as diachronic studies, okay? Diachronic studies, diachronic studies, and here we are talking about diachronics, okay? Diachronic studies, okay? Uh, dynamics, how language changes, etc. Okay? Evolution, dynamics of the uh, development of language, right? Uh, then, the other one is called typology, okay? The other one is called typology, in which we are comparing languages. Yes, please, you have it. We are comparing Languages. So you take English, French, Arabic, and then you compare. We are making a typology of each language and you try to find out the common things between them and then the differences between. Okay? So these are different ways how linguistics operates. At the level of phonetics, you just focus on the sounds, how they are produced, and the manner of production. Level of phonology, how they are combined together. Are there any differences? That's our results from this combination or no? Then word level, then pragmatics, then social linguistics, you move on to variable. These are different ways how linguistics or linguists do their job. Okay? So, 
this is the. Do you have any questions before I move on in relation to this? So I remember this, uh, okay? Name, okay, called gene at P7, okay? And this metaphor she gives us, I think it's a good metaphor. I think it's a good one that will help you to remember what we, yeah, makes things simple for you. I hope so, okay? My animation, good. Now, here we are starting uh, to talk about the uh, historical background, okay, and the schools of linguistics. Throughout history, there were two types of schools. In the beginning, there used to be what we call perspective school, or perspective perspective, okay? And then descriptive, okay? So. Uh, and the, 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 the com there was a kind of competition between this that people refer to it as a kind of battle. That's why I put the picture of two people fighting there. So one is a perspective and then the other one is descriptive, okay? So this is, uh, so there are, it used to be a kind of battle between the two. So they say, we are the right linguists and you are the wrong linguists. And the others they say, we are the wrong right linguists and you are the... And one they say, our perspective, the prescriptive, and we're going to see what we mean by this uh, later on, and then descriptive, uh, what we mean by descriptive. So there was a kind of convention. So historically speaking, the prescriptive first, and then the descriptive, okay? Prescriptive, no, it's, there is a mistake in there. It's prescriptive, anyway. Prescriptive, here it is, uh, it's correct in here, okay? It's correct. Prescriptive school, so, up till the 18th century, linguists used to be prescriptive. Again, I make the same, because these are words are a bit confusing. You know what we mean by perspective? Perspective is the angle from which you see things, your approach, your theory. And then you have prescriptive. I'm talking here about prescriptive. Used to be prescriptive, okay? Sorry for this mistake, because I was doing a hurry, a bit of hurry, and I... You know, it was kind of confusing words, so I made a mistake in there. But it, that's it. So the main figures in this uh, are Loth, uh, 1762, and Morai, 1794. So uh, what are the main uh, principles of this school, this prescriptive, prescriptive school? So uh, they try to prescribe rules of correctness. They prescribe, like a doctor, you know a doctor? And he goes, doctor, and then they prescribe for you, these are the medications you should take in order to, get, to recover, okay? So they tell you, these are the rules you should follow in order to speak language correctly. So that's prescriptive, okay? So they try to prescribe rules of correctness, okay? They tell you, this is how you should speak. Put the verb here and the subject here, whatever kind of rule, okay? These rules are often based on Latin grammar and logic, okay? Latin grammar and logic. These rules are based on the written language, because when you are speaking, it's different from when you are writing. First of all, when you are speaking, you are like I'm doing now, you are speaking in a hurry, you don't have enough time to think and to organize your words, and then you speak spontaneously. Okay? But when you are writing, you are analyzing, this is a good word, I should use it, this is not a good word, and then even if you think it's not good after you put it, then you can change and correct it. So, okay, so this, this is uh, the kind of prescriptive uh, school. It used to be uh, rely on written language, what it should be correct. Because when you are told writing, we are always thinking this way. This is, should, this is the way we should do it. This is the way we should, not the way we should, this is not the way we should do it. We should omit it. This is the way I should do it, and then I should correct, okay? So it's based on the written language, with the misconception that the written language is somehow the basis for the spoken language. That's the, what they think at that time. They thought that the written language is the basis of the spoken language, okay? Prescriptivists advocate the standard, the dialects of the powerful elite as correct, like when you are if you go to the United States, for you, for example, you speak English. You, you speak uh, standard English, okay? Correct English. 
And then when you are going to mix with the others, so you they speak the vernacular in some areas of the United States, so they, they speak the vernacular, no rules, no mistakes. But you, you speak correctly and so on, good vocabulary, clean vocabulary. So that's the what the prescriptivist advocate. Advocate means they tell you this is what you should do. Okay? Uh, so the standard. And usually the standard, uh, they choose the, you know, in society, in our society or in whatever society, there are, there are what we call the elites. And usually these elite people, this social class, they have a good, clean language. Okay? Usually. Okay, so that's why they take it and they take it as a model for uh, advocating the rules of correctness. Okay? So this is the prescriptivist. So the most important thing you, can, you should remember about all this is this one. They try to prescribe the rules of correctness. That's their rule. They sit and then they start making rules. This is how you should speak. Okay? And then we're going to see when we talk about descriptive, and you're going to understand better uh, prescriptive and descriptive, okay? Okay, this is okay. Now, descriptive perspective, you can just take the word descriptive, describe, the main verb is here, to describe, okay? What do you do when you describe? You take something, and then you start, Describe it. Uh, long hair, short hair, tall, short, fat, thin, etc. You don't prescribe anything. Okay? You don't give rules. You take the uh, unit and then you depict it as it is. Okay? There is no prescription, there are no rules of correctness, etc. You just take it and then you describe. So, important descriptivists of the main figures in this school are. Uh, sweet and Jesperson. Now, what do they say? Descriptivist pers uh, descriptivists, okay? So, forget about this first part. So, descriptivists try to describe a language. They try to describe a language. So, they take language, whatever it is, and then they describe it. Uh, and got money. It's grammatical because it is systematically used by native speakers. It is used by native speakers. But for you, you're going to tell me, I ain't? What's that? It's not good English, standard English, no. This is how you should speak. That's a kind of perspective which is prescriptive. But for these people, they take whatever language and then describe it. Because it is used by native speakers, so they describe it. And they don't tell you, this is wrong, this is correct. Or they don't tell you, these are the rules for correctness, and these are the rules of uh, okay, mistakes. The language in use today, synchronic perspective, is of uh, main interest. They focus on the language used nowadays. Linguist who is belonging to the school doesn't refer to the past, to the past. Okay? Takes what happens actual now. Okay? At the moment. So they focus on the language in use today. Uh, so that's why you have synchronic perspective. Synchronic by opposition to dichronic. Dichronic, you are talking about historical development, referring to the past. But synchronic, you are to referring to the moment. Okay? So that's why it is of main interest. So these are the features of this school, okay? Features and characteristics of this school. Uh, it does not try to advocate dying forms such as the subjunctive. And then spoken language is primary. Spoken language is primary to the descriptivists, so they focus more on the spoken language. They don't focus on the written language, the prescriptivists. Prescriptivists, they focus on written language. They, take, they always think in terms of written language. But these descriptivists, they take the everyday language use and then study that. Okay, so they focus on uh, uh, language spoken. All variants of a language, standard, or vulgar are of epical interest and value. Even if it's not good language, you know, they take it and then they analyze it. Even if it's just vernacular, and then they analyze it. They don't start talking to you, oh, this is wrong, I should forget about it. This is correct, what you should do, okay? So they focus on spoken language, whatever it is, okay? 
We don't care about correctness or not correctness. It's as far as it is spoken by native speakers. Okay? So this is the scope of linguistics, okay? But of course the details you have them in the book, okay? You have the details in the book. So, what is language? Okay. I spent a lot of time, just to share with you some, something. I spent a lot of time to find a picture like this one, in which includes Arabic uh, alphabet. Because most of the pictures, Latin, English, French, or something similar. And I didn't want to exclude my language. So I, I spent a lot of time going through the images until I found this one. So that's why I put it for you here. So it includes you know, a variety of languages in there. So, okay? so what is language, OK? So what is language? <coughs> so here you already have some uh, main figures uh, that's, uh, are, that's marked the study of language, OK? Uh, Saussure, Jesperson, and Chomsky, and we're going to refer to them Later, what does Saussure say? Or does Saussure say? Uh, what does uh, Chomsky say? Jesperson say? Uh, main ideas of each one of them. Okay, but just referring to the fact that these are the main figures that investigated language and uh, gave good theories about that. Okay, so human language is characterized by the following. So when we're talking about human language, remember what I said in the beginning. You can have animal language. But there are differences between human language and animal language. Some good features that human language has makes it much better than animal language. Animal language is limited, okay? And then human language is much better. Why? It's not limited. Why? Because of the following features. So, and when we are talking about these features, we are talking about the definition of language. The first feature is that it is a system of sound signals. It is a system of sound signals. When I'm talking now, I'm, refer I'm using signals, okay? Sound signals, okay? I'm using sound signals, okay? These sound signals, they go out from my mouth, and then they go and reach your drum in here, in the uh, ears, and then you uh, go into the mind, the mind analyzes that, and then you understand, and then you say, you smile, or you cry, or whatever, okay? So, that's uh, sound, okay, signals. Sound signals. And then, the other thing we have to pay attention to here is, it is a system. It is a system. It's not something random, just like that. It is a system. Something you have there, sound signals that go out, they are organized, they have a system. Okay? Uh, the other feature is that it is arbitrary. One of the main features of language is that of arbitrariness. Arbitrariness. Arbitrariness is the fact that when you take the sound or the words, and then the meaning, is there any logical relationship between the sound or the word and the meaning? Cat. The word cat. And then the, 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 the meaning, the animal there. There is no relationship, okay? So that is arbitra arbitrary, okay? So this is what we mean by arbitrary relationship between the, what we say, or the words, and then the concepts. Okay? There's no relationship. There's no reason why cat is, is called cat. There's no reason in cat, the animal, that we make such call it. It's arbitrary. Okay? This this one of duality. Okay? Anybody who has an idea about this one? I know that you have arbitrariness and okay? duality. Uh huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, it has something like that. So synonyms and so on. Okay, and then structure dependent. The fact that it is depends on the structure. Okay, when you produce language, as we said, it has a system. Okay, it has a structure. You have to put the subject first, and then the verb, and then the complement. You don't have to put the complement and then the 
subjects and then the verb in English. I'm talking here about English, okay? So there is a structure depending. It depends on the structure. If you don't use any structure, so you speak in nonsense, okay? Creative, yes? Creative means that, uh, the, as you have just said now, that uh, animal language is uh, limited rather than uh, human language. You can uh, create, create. Uh, uh, different or new situation. You can, you can create something that is not existing. Yes, okay. Right, new words, new structures, new, new sentences, etc. So it's creativity. From a limited set of sound signals and words, or sound signals, you can make an infinite okay, set or number of words. Sounds are limited. A, B, C, D, limited. But from this limited number of sounds, you can make an infinite number of words. Okay, every time it creates. Okay, creativity. And also cannot be memorized sentences. And not cannot be? Memorized sentences. For example, if if you know some information about uh, any other language, mm -hmm. and uh, you memorize some sentences, if you go to communicate with someone whose native language uh, is, you will not be good. You yeah. will not speak appropriately, okay? This is a bit different, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, displacement. Displacement. Yes. 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 Yeah. Displacement. It means, for example, now you are here, and I can say that your parents are at home, maybe. So, which means that I'm talking about something that doesn't exist now, okay? And, for example, I can speak about 1991. 1991? So, you know this idea? You use language to talk about something that don't exist in the now and in the here. Okay? You have here and you have now. You are here. But your parents are not here. I can talk about that. This is a feature of language. Displacement. Uh, this is 2013, it's here and now, and I can talk about 1991, or I can talk about the First World War, First Second World War, it's happened in the past, so I refer to the past, so displacement, okay, this is what we mean by displacement, okay, you refer to things, or concepts, or, or concepts, or uh, ideas, or whatever, that don't exist necessarily in the here and in the now. Okay, this place, which you can okay, one of the main features of language. <coughs> now, the idea uh, of a system. Okay, the idea of a system. Uh, this is uh, one way to exemplify that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to forget about my animation, but I'm going to do it later. Let me just uh, speak because time is uh, passing by, uh, running. The system. Uh, an example, so for example, you have Mustafa is driving his car dangerously. Okay, this is one sentence. It's correct, good. It has got a system, okay? Subject, verb, uh, complement, etc. Okay, it's correct. And then, instead of Mustafa, you can have Bushra, Aisha, and others. Okay, instead of is, you can have am, was, has been, whatever, in your mind. In your brain, this is what you have, okay? Uh, driving, you can have eating, chewing, studying, whatever, in your mind. This is what you have, okay? You have verbs, you have sounds, nouns, you have adjectives, etc. But you can't, for example, for example, you can't uh, put am um instead of Mustafa. You say, am um is. Can you do that? You can't say, for example, uh, Bushra. Uh, or Mustafa is driving his car, Tajin. <laughs> no, doesn't work. You have to use an adjective. <laughs> or sorry, you have to use an adverb. Okay? You have to use an adverb that modifies the verb there, dangerously. So therefore, instead of dangerously, you can say fastly or quickly or slowly or whatever. 
Okay? So therefore, this is the system. We are talking about a system in here. Okay? So therefore, if you want to make changes, so for example, what you can do is this. I'm going to use my animations as an example. It's okay. So look at the circles, okay? Okay. By eating Bushra was. Can you read the sentence for me? Was eating my tajin, sorry, my meal hungrily. It's correct. But you can't uh, use, for example, Bushra was eating my Mustafa hungrily. <laughs> No. Okay? So, this is what we mean by system. Another example, look now at the uh, squares. Sorry, because I'm repeating. So, yes, is Ajin reluctantly Aisha showing. Can you read the sentence with the words with the squares? Aisha is showing her Ajin reluctantly. It's not a really good sentence, but I just want to use these kind of examples to help you remember, okay? Talking about Tajin, maybe so it helps you remember, okay? The, uh, the fact that we have a system, okay? System, okay? So, this, you understand now what we mean by system, okay? So, that's the, uh, one of the uh, main characteristics of language, which is a system of sound signals, words, and so on. And then, in terms of language, you can talk about different types of relations or relationships. You can have paradigmatic relations, like proper nouns that exist in your language, the verbs that exist in your language, the adjectives that exist, and all the adverbs, and all the nouns, and all the pronouns, and all the related pronouns, and so on and so forth. So this is paradigmatic relations, okay? And then you have the syntagmatic relations. You go this way. Okay? You go this way. So you have subject, verb, complement, etc. This is a syntagmatic relations. And when we talk about syntax, in syntax, this is what we talk about. We are talking about syntagmatic relations. Yes? The paradigmatic is the linear relationship. This way. Yes. The syntagmatic relations go this way within the sentence, okay? Okay. Now, can, a little bit of detail concerning the schools of, okay, linguistics. Now, in the past, in the past, uh, you know, there were philosophers, there were thinkers, and how, what did they, what did they think about language? Okay. So one of the main figures here is this one called uh, William Jones, Sir William Jones. Okay. So uh, what did he say about language? So just to show you what the thinking or the principles that were uh, existing in the past, because this is. Uh, represent a school, past school of linguistics, okay? So, for example, he used to think that language was God-given, imposed by God, okay? Because in the past there was a lot of religion, okay, and so on. So it was imposed by God on the human being, okay? Uh, so William Jones discovered, etc., and Latin. They showed too many similarities to be merely coincidental when he compared between languages. He found out that there were many uh, common things that makes it impossible to think that these common things are coincidental. Okay, so like uh, you think for us when we are talking about the existence of Allah and God, we say that what exists is not coincidental because there are certain things that cannot exist by coincidence. Okay, so the same thing for these people when thinking about language and investigating language. They used to find out that there are many common things between different languages that existed in the past. What are the languages that exist in the past? So you have Sanskrit, Persian, Greek, and Latin. So they found that they're common. And that's why they thought that maybe because of this reason it was imposed by God, okay, on the human beings, okay? 
These languages are sprung from the same source, which is perhaps no, which perhaps no longer exists. Okay, they say they used to think that this. Uh, common things that exist in different languages, they come from the same source. They used to be part of mother language in the past. And then uh, from this mother language came these common things that in uh, Sanskrit, Persian, Greek, and Latin. So these are some of the thinking and ideas that existed in that time. The search for Proto-Indo-European had begun. Language was regarded as developing species. You remember the stories that came later on of Darwin? talking about the uh, development of the human being, and they say that we belong to the same father, okay? So the same thing for the, these people uh, when they investigated language. They, they, they saw that the languages exhibited a number of common things, which makes it impossible to think that they come from different sources. They all come from the same source, and therefore, here comes the beginning of the study of the historical linguistics to go back into Indo-European uh, okay, uh, language to go back and to see, try to find out or to build a picture of this mother language from which Sanskrit, Persian, Greek, and Latin came. Okay, so this is uh, these are the main features of of this school. In a way. And then, okay, another main school that came afterwards of linguistics, which is one of the main schools, it is the one by Ferdinand Dossossier, okay? The one by Ferdinand Dossossier, okay? Father, who is referred to as the father of linguistics. Is referred to as the father of linguistics. I try it, uh, to give you the pictures of the people. Uh, because I think it's good to have these pictures. When we were studying, we never had something like this. We just referred to the association school. Okay, so. okay, how he looked like and so on. This is very important to keep in mind, okay? So, Ferdinand de Saussure designed a new approach. Yes, please. He designed a new approach to uh, linguistics in his course in general linguistics, Cours de Linguistique Générale, okay? What happened for the Sur in uh, Sorbonne, in Paris, in Paris, he was making lectures, and he had good students. He had new ideas, good ideas, that inspired a number of the students he had, okay? And these students, after he died, what did he do, what did they do? They combined his lectures and then made them in the form of a book, which they called Cours de Linguistique Générale. And this Cours de Linguistique uh, incorporated, that you can find, okay, you can get it, it's like this, uh, which includes Okay, his ideas about language. And I'm going to talk about his ideas after, after this slide, okay? What did he say? Now, uh, one of the main quotations by Ferdinand de Saussure from his uh, Cours de Linguistique Générale, I am the father of modern linguistics. He wasn't modest, okay? No modesty, but uh, he, was, he was a great man. Anyway, I believe in synchronic studies, focusing on the language now, doesn't focus on diachronic like the William Jones. William Jones, diachronic. This one, synchronic, now. I believe in synchronic studies as the most important pursuit of a linguist. You know, whenever somebody comes, say something different from what's come in the past. So in the past, they used to focus on diachronic, historical, and so on, referring to the past. But he, he was referring always to now. So, pursuit of a language. I distinguish between long and parole, and I'm going to talk about these in the following slide. So, he, these are some of his main concepts long, parole. And Chomsky then afterwards came with his own dichotomy referred to as competence performance. Okay? I uh, insist that language is a carefully built system. One of his main ideas, Binya, okay, system, okay. Uh, as I explained to you in the previous example of Tajit example, if you remember, uh, and claim that the sign is a combination of the signifier and the signifier. Another concept that he advocated, dichotomy that he advocated, which is the signify signifier. And I'm going to uh, talk about this in the following slides. Modern structural linguistics have begun. That was marked the beginning of uh, structural uh, linguistics. 
And what are the main ideas? So, uh, so soon on the uh, general nature of language, so uh, he uh, composed or he advocated a number of principles. So, language is a matter of sociology. He, he was referring to the fact that there is some combination between society and language, and that's why he came up with performance, okay? Wrong, which is abstract, that exists in the mind, and then the performance, what we say to each other, what I say to you, what I say to my friend, is different from what I say to my father, or my mother, or my friend. So, sociology, so there's a relationship there, a reference to the relationship between society, sociology, and language. Language is systematic, as I explained, it's not random, so you have to put adjectives in the appropriate place, a verb in the appropriate place, etc. There are two sides to language, langue, okay, and parole, the individual component. So, uh, this is the long, what exists in the mind, and which is shared. What does it mean, social, here? It means that it's shared between all the people, okay, the rules that exist in the mind, the rules of the language, okay, that exist in your mind, in my mind, okay. And then, perform or parole, it is the, what I say, personally. What you say personally, the way I say it is different from the way you say it. There are some common things, but there are some uh, differences. Yes, please. Uh, for example, if we want to make a cup of tea, mm -hmm. we all have the raw materials, how to bring that. But the performance, it can be uh, differentiated. Yes. Anyway, the, then the other thing is the signifier versus Signifying, okay? Let me show you the next slide here. Okay, so, uh, signifier, and then signify. So, signifier, which is the, the word. Signify, you can understand. It's, what, it's the concepts. It's what you are talking about. When you say cat, you have cat, the word cat, and then the concept cat, the animal. That's the signifier, okay? Now, there is a relationship Mutual relationship between signifiers and signified, okay? Uh, and here, uh, there is this uh, 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 example, for example, uh, in our world, especially in the Gulf, uh, when we have the word uh, Tamar. And for this word, for this concept, okay? For this concept, we have different words. We have Tamar, we have Balah, we have uh, Rutab. Etc. But if you go to English, you have only one word. Okay, so there are. So it's just to show you that the society and signifier and signified, there is a relationship. Okay, between them. Okay, the signifier and signified in English is different from Arabic. Why? Because of the context, because of the society, etc. So, uh, and then uh, this is what we mean by signifier and signified. So, book. This is the book, copy book, and then the word copy book. Okay? And then there is a, a relationship that is uh, influenced by society. Okay? The influence or the, uh, the relationship between Balah or Tamar in the Arab Gulf or the Arab world is different from the relationship between dates and the Anglophone countries. Because, uh, you know, one of the main features of the Arab world is the Gulf is that the main product they are consuming is, uh, okay, uh, dates, okay? So that's why you have different dates and you have different terminology, etc. The same thing for snow. If you go to snow in the North Pole, and then you are going to find out that they have different words for snow. But in English, there is only one, okay? So different, depending on the context again. So, other ideas uh, that we have to refer, uh, to keep in mind about uh, the change from the old school and this Luciferian school is that language is not set or imposed by God. They no more think of that way. Okay? God told Adam what objects meant. This is for the previous school. This is what we meant by, by God imposed language on the human being. Okay? They used to think that it's Adam and then our God. Okay? That's it. Like in our Islam, so the same kind of story. Saussure questioned all this. So Saussure 
question all this. He didn't believe in that, okay? Uh, it is not said by God, but rather by society. That's what he thinks. Okay? So there is a okay, society. The society that um, uh, imposes on us the kind of language we use. So that's why you have different types of dates. Balak, Tama, for the Gulf. And then only one word for the same product in English, okay? Because of society. Long that, long that decides what a particular sound signifies, the work of society and its role to set the relationship between signifiers and signifiers. This, this is the meaning of the picture illustration you have on the top. My animation, good. Now, other uh, figures or other schools, okay, other schools, we also what we have the American school, okay, of linguistics. Okay, by opposition to those of you, etc. American School of Linguistics, and the main figures are, as you can see here, Leonard Bloomfield, Franz Boas, Edward Sapir, Benjamin Dewar. Okay, these are the main figures. I guess you have heard about some of them, especially uh, Sapir and Work. You remember, maybe you heard about the Sapir Work hypothesis? Okay, the relationship between language and thought. What impacts the other? Is it language that impacts thought or thought that impacts language? This is the software work hypothesis. So these are the main figures. Now what do they uh, think, these people? My animation, good, nice. Nice pictures, nice people. Yes, American descriptive schools. So what do they think and uh, uh, believe? Uh, I'm not going to switch on the lights because it's good for the uh, data show. Sapir worked with Native American languages and together with work, he described as a mentalist. He is described as a mentalist. He was referred to together with Sapir as a mentalist because they were thinking about thought, thinking, and the relationship between thinking and okay language. The Sapir work hypothesis is formulated from their claims. What are their claims? The main claims that you have to remember, language determines the way we think. They claim that language determines the way we think. Linguistic determinism. The distinctions encoded in one language are not found in any other language. The linguistic relatability. So, in, in the other schools, we were talking about common things. They focused on the, on the common things between languages. These people, they refer to or focus on the differences between the, okay, the distinctions encoded in one language are not found in other languages, so they are different. So they focus on differences between languages, and this is referred to as linguistic, one of the main principles, linguistic relativity. Uh, language determines the way we think. The conceptual organization of uh, our language forces us to perceive and interpret the world in a certain way. Translation from one language to another is impossible because of linguistic relativity. Because they were focused, they focused on differences, so they think and they say that uh, it's difficult or impossible to translate from one language to another. And these people, Sapir, War, and the others, uh, in, in America, you know that America, you know, was discovered. Now they were the Native Americans. So what these people did is that they uh, were afraid were afraid that the language of those noted Americans, the Indians, what are referred to as the Indians, they were afraid that their languages are going to die, so what they started to do is to investigate their languages, okay? And when they investigated their languages, they found out that there are certain things that they couldn't understand or because of the culture of those people, which is different from their own culture. So hence, these principles for you here, okay? So they, that's how uh, things developed. This is just a repetition of the same, uh, same kind of uh, things. And finally, finally, uh, the latest uh, figure that uh, marks the recent uh, uh, linguistics is uh, Chomsky. Chomsky, I guess you hear uh, this name uh, nowadays more in politics. Is now more interested in politics. Okay. Uh, yes, etc. <laughs> But uh, basically, he was a physicist, I guess, and then, uh, or mathematician, I don't remember exactly his origin, uh, main field. But then he became interested in language. 
And then he started uh, studying language, and then started advocating his own principles of language and linguistics. Okay, he talked about universal grammar. Uh, not interested in the specific description of language, but rather general principles applicable to all languages. So he was, he was studying language in order to come up with this universal grammar. Because he thought that uh, when we are born, we are endowed with language, we are genetic. Okay? And then, uh, when studying language, he wanted to come up with this kind of universal grammar that exists uh, and share between all languages. Okay? It is shared between all languages. The structure of human mind determines language, different from uh, the previous ones of the world. Language determines the way we think. This one, the human mind determines language. This is part of human nature and must be genetically inherited. He thought that it was genetically inherited. Okay? You are, when you are born, you are born with this language acquisition device. He talks about this device called language acquisition device, LAD. And then, like a baby, it starts growing. And when it starts growing, you start speaking sound and yeah, words and etc. And then it grows, you know. Okay, rules. So uh, that's uh, one of his main principles. So Chomsky makes a uh, distinction between competence and performance, like this is here. It's almost the same thing. Small differences in there. So competence is what we have in mind and which is shared between all human beings, depend whatever language. And then performance is what we say. What we say actually, performance. Okay. And there are a number of things to be said in there. The pursuit of, uh, and then uh, one of his uh, new theories is what's referred to as uh, transformation of generative grammar. He started with generative grammar, not enough for him, and then he came up with transformational generative grammar. Generative grammar, why? Because referring to the idea of creativity. Creativity, it means that from a stiff, uh, limited uh, uh, number of sounds, we can make an infinite number of words. How? It's thanks to this generative grammar that we have in mind. We have generative grammar, the ability to generate words. Okay? And then, transformational, transformational, because, uh, you know, rules, there are rules that apply in there. Okay? When we move something to another, so transformational, uh, generative grammar. Okay? So, uh, please, please, I want you to get a copy of the book. Okay, and then read the first chapters, okay, first, I guess it's the first two chapters, okay, uh, in which you have a bit more detail about this, okay? And thank you.